Amy Rose White, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thanks so much for having me, Amy. Amy Rose, a uh, bit of a thrill to have you on the show today. This is a topic or topics that we haven't really explored in major detail here. But for the folks that don't know, you've never heard of you, poor sods. Who is Amy Rose when she's at home? Mm, at home? Yeah, and when at work. I- <laughs> Okay, well, home is work. Uh, I would say I am an intuitive and integrative psychotherapist, and I work from home, so that's a big part of my life. I specialize in perinatal mental health, so I mainly serve people, women, families who are struggling around emotional health conditions related to pregnancy and postpartum, miscarriage, adoption, loss, abortion. Um, That's only part of my passion. I also work with a lot of people in transition. Um, I would consider myself uh, deeply embedded in psycho-spiritual healing. So people who are looking to make really massive transformation and their relationship to themselves in the world. That's part of what happens here. And then uh, the other part of my life is playing my guitar and singing loudly, hoping my neighbors don't uh, complain. (laughs) Um, And dancing around and being with my children and playing in the mountains and creating loving spaces with people. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And just for our male audience members that are dialing in, this is for you as well, because anyone that's that's a father, planning on being a father, an uncle, or anyone that's going to have any involvement with anyone making babies, this is for you. Because Amy Rose has a plethora of knowledge that will allow you to be empowered to maybe help your sister-in-law or uh, someone in your family that might not have the knowledge that you'll acquire after listening to this, the truth bombs that Amy Rose is likely going to drop today. So we're very excited to have you on the show. It's a, it's a real thrill. And uh, in the short time that we've known each other, you've had a profound impact on my life. And, and i got to thank uh, Dr. Alan Thompson for the introduction. Uh, first question for you, Amy Rose, where did, this, where did this desire to move into the field that you're in now come from? You know, the psychological answer is I'm probably trying to heal my past. And, you know, that's a true um, response given (laughs) as a psychotherapist. I grew up with a mom that struggled with mental health issues. And I think even as a really long, young child, I was cognizant of the fact that she did try to reach out for help and really couldn't find it, couldn't access it, didn't understand what was happening to her. So I think on an unconscious level from a very young age, I was drawn to working with children and their parents, um, special needs children, the child abuse prevention field, because although we like to speak in the maternal mental health realm, um, really in a strengths-based way, you know, that these issues are preventable, they're treatable. The reality is, you know, when we're showing up as parents in ways that don't feel great to us, yelling, screaming, hitting, you know, abuse can often be related to untreated mental health stuff. So I think in my own way, I've been trying to heal her, heal my own past and provide um, what she didn't have and, and really create a different culture around how we discuss how to be a parent and the impact of having babies and that it is not really natural. <laughs> and we're doing it in isolation, reinventing the wheel next box, next to little box and Um, It's really, really freaking hard. And I think we need to normalize the emotional complications that come along with it and the struggles, um, you know, associated that we're too ashamed to discuss. The the difference between a psychotherapist, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, could you explain that for us, please? Sure. A psychotherapist is basically a mental health provider that typically has a master's degree that is oriented a little, um, we call this an explanatory model. So it's understanding people's present experience based on their past. But most of us, uh, I would say the most effective psychotherapists are very focused in the present, the here and now. We might be doing trauma work related to symptoms, but we're really focused on what it looks like right now. Behavioral change, um, symptom reduction. I mean, these are really kind of clinical terms for helping people return back to who they are, the the wellness and wholeness of who they are. A psychologist is someone that probably has a similar orientation or does somewhat similar work, but has a PhD. And then a psychiatrist has an MD. They are uh, able to prescribe 
uh, medications, psychotropic medications and the like, they may or may not actually provide therapeutic services as well. Some do, some don't. Yeah, and I think it's a good question to ask because uh, we can all pretend to know what all these uh, the terminology means, but I think understanding it allows you to make better decisions in terms of who, who you need to seek out when you're going through whatever challenges. Thankfully, in my own healing journey, I got access to a gambling psychologist, and uh, I really felt sorry for that woman. Her name was Lee. <laughs> she wore the the world on her on her face. She was probably looked twenty years older than what she was, and I think she was taking on all of the world's problems. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about being in that environment. It sounds to me like what you do has slightly more uplifting moments at times, <laughs> hopefully at least. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's such a good commentary. I think it really depends on your personal orientation. And my philosophy has always been, it's not what I know or even what I say that's helpful to people, it's who I am. And I laugh a lot. Uh, in my sessions, I was just actually visiting my parents out of state and I worked for a day, used their office and I said, hey, you know, did you hear anything? I was trying to kind of keep it down and play a noise machine. And they said, oh, we just heard you laughing. <laughs> and I feel like um, if you bring joy and levity to these really dark, deep problems that people present with, um, it doesn't have to age you. In fact, I would say I've healed tremendously through my work. It's it's basically not, I don't believe in altruism. I think it's inherently selfish to be a helper of any kind. <laughs> so I, I feel sorry for her. I don't I don't know what was going on with Lee. <laughs> well, I um I, I tried to reach out uh, in the last 24 months uh, through the organization that I got access to, to, to let her know, to thank her for um really what had happened in my life. And I and and I would say that I'd be a tremendous success story and, and it would be important for me if I was in her shoes to hear that. So I don't know whether she'll ever hear about it. Maybe I need to get famous enough if she's still alive, she can hear about it. But, um, and one thing I would say about you, uh, Amy Rose, is that for those who are just listening, she's smoking hot. She's beautiful. And you're a mum. you got two children, last I checked, two boys. Yes, that's very, very kind of you. Yep, they're almost grown, 16 and 18. You hardly look old enough to have babies, but there you go. And what do you reckon is the secret to your radiating beauty to this point? Uh, I'm truly, truly happy. I'm truly happy with my life and who I am. And I think that radiates out. And I drink a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> Was that always the case, being truly happy? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. In fact, it's interesting because it's so kind of you to say um, those physical compliments, but I would say that in terms of just the way I perceive myself physically and feedback I get from other people, even though I'm the ripe old age of 46, um, I like the way that I look and feel the older I get. And that's purely a reflection of doing a lot of uh, I hate to say the word work. I don't really love the idea of doing the work. Um, that doesn't really appeal to me. The necessary. Yeah, it's more about like gently returning <laughs> to myself. You know, gently returning to that little kid that, you know, loved to run around and pick flowers and give them to people when I, you know, was seven or ride my bike. You know, I'm an 80s kid, so I had a banana seat with flowers on it. You know, like the feeling in your body that when you remember those moments of your childhood that are positive, like that's what I've worked on cultivating, returning back to like who that little kid was before she learned that life could be painful. And um, that, you know, it sounds really trite, but learning to love that little person and protect that person and, and indulge her in, you know, what she really loves to do. I think that results in you looking and feeling different. And happiness, by the way, my definition has nothing to do with some permanent uh, state of contentment or bliss. It's really accepting what is in every right now moment uh, with, with gratitude and appreciation, e even in really dark moments. Do you think coming to that conclusion has made you a better therapist? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because it means that I completely trust myself and life. And when you're sitting across from someone who's struggling and you have that conviction, um, they can join you. 
in that space. I'm putting you on the spot here, uh, Amy Rose, because we haven't spoken about this beforehand, but you've treated, I'm guessing, thousands of patients over the course of your 20 something years now. Have you noticed a pattern of rejuvenation in the men and women that you work with physically? Oh, physically, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. Yeah, I would have to say so, simply because when we're suffering, we're disconnected from source energy. It doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. It just means we're disconnected. We're disconnected from the love that we are. We're disconnected from safety. And that is an energy, trust, safety, love. It's the highest frequency. So when we get reconnected to that, yeah, you see it. You see it change. Um, it's actually my favorite part about working with people is I can see that change in, in an instant, in a moment, you know, within a 50-minute session. And I always, I always say that, like, look what happened. I just see, like, I can see it around you. I can see your shoulders lifted, like you're smiling. You began the session and you're crying. That's nothing that I have done. It's something that we're creating together <clears throat> in the session. And, and like I said, returning back to who they really are, which is, which is safety, it's love, it's trust, it's possibility. It's not rigidity. I'm trapped. There's no options. You know, that's where people are usually at when they come. So apart from the obvious incentives to physically look better, what are some other really great reasons to seek therapy? with what you do, particularly around postpartum, postnatal, prenatal, that type of thing? Well, with regard to that, if you are not feeling like yourself during pregnancy, postpartum, this goes for both partners of any gender, by the way, uh, that sets the foundation for how you expect the whole thing to go. And it has an impact on your relationship, your self-image, your self-esteem, how you parent, if you're not feeling like yourself, and that's the litmus test, you know, I don't know if you're going to ask me about signs and symptoms today, you know, as people often do, but it's real. If you do not deeply feel like yourself, um, it is time to seek more support. And what I always tell people, you know, one of the reasons you and I are talking is that I'm a big fan of the coaching movement. I work with coaches and therapists for myself as a client. I have a coaching style. I'd always tell people I have, I'm an active and directive psychotherapist. So if you want someone to just nod and listen for, you know, an hour and you carry on your way, I'm probably not your girl. Not because I'm not willing to do that. And there's a ton of listening, obviously on my end, um, but because I'm really interested in making a plan and moving forward because I just found that that's more helpful to people. So <clears throat> if you're not feeling like yourself, you might not feel like yourself for years if, it, if it's happening around postpartum because you're gonna be sleep deprived, you're gonna have your sexual relationship has totally changed, you know, you're gonna be physically depleted if you're someone who's carried a baby. Like that stuff doesn't typically resolve on its own completely. If it does, it takes usually like a year um, and there can be really long-term effects. And then if you think about multiple babies in a row, like it's the, the long-term consequences can be devastating if that's, if you try to muscle through. That's my biggest point of advice. Don't muscle through. Whether you're pregnant or postpartum or you're, you know, 58 and you've never had kids and you just are not living the life that you, that you want. Don't settle. There's a great quote from a guy, Les Brown, who some of you will know, and if, if you listen to the show regularly, you'll know uh, this quote inside and out, but he says, ask for help, not so that you appear weak, but so that you can remain strong and keep asking for help until you get it. And there's been some development in my own life with regards to uh, adopting that, which I've been doing really, really well for the last couple of years. But I've also gotten better at receiving help. And, mm. and what I mean by that is it's not all about remaining, well, it's not at all remaining in a victim mindset. It's all about acknowledging that you trying to achieve what you want to achieve completely by yourself will end in disaster. Every single successful person on the planet, they can lie, lie until they're blue in the face about doing it all by themselves, but they didn't. I can promise you that, right? And, and by receiving the help, I'm allowing other people to give, which is part of their love language, and then because I'm way more empowered, I can then help more people than I would have been able, would have been able to before I'd received the help. And what are your thoughts on that? Couldn't, couldn't agree more. It's beautiful. Yeah, it takes humility to receive. 
And it's very, very difficult for most people. And especially mums, it seems to, there seems to be a reoccurring theme. Why is that? I think we're highly socialized as women to somehow find that particular task natural, to be very effective at it. Um, there's a lot of sister wounding about competition between women, unfortunately, just really, really sad. And, you know, you can blame the media and cultural stereotypes and all the massive influences we have around comparing ourselves to what, you know, a good mom should look like and what we should be doing. And, uh, I would argue that systems, you know, of oppression around women definitely have something to do with that. It's like, have it all, but don't have too much, you know, be, be a devoted mom, but don't be helicopter. I mean, you just, you cannot win, you know, be, be there for your husband, but also have a job and remember all the pediatrician and dentist visits, but, you know, be ready to have amazing sex every night. Like, it's just impossible. <laughs> it's the expectations are impossible. So if women believe those distorted expectations, if they, if they buy into them, then they'll hold themselves to extraordinary standard. They'll get very sick. Um, and healing is really about dismantling those internal and external belief systems, which is garbage. It's something I learned recently, uh, I, I haven't been able to verify by reading the paper, but it sounds like it's, it's a pretty reasonable, reliable fact. The, the most unhappy demograph demographic of people on the planet are 40 to 45 year old childless women that are like career driven. And it was to do with um, something to do with like denying the biological urge and people choose to do whatever they want to do, but they, they end up uh, missing an opportunity biologically to create a family and it, it has some devastating flow and effect. I will never purport to be an expert on the subject, but is this anything that you're familiar with and can comment on? Uh, who, who designed the study? Who's the study done by? I'd have to go and do some more research on that. I can't, I can't so remember. So that. that would matter to me. The last time I looked at that research, it was actually that group was the happiest. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I don't know, I haven't looked at that data in a while, but married, you know, kind of middle-aged married couples tend to historically have ranked, uh, lowest on the happiness scale. Uh, however, I could see, you know, I, I'm just wondering if there's sort of, um, all research can be cold to a certain outcome. And it depends on how they ask the questions, who they ask the questions to, and um, you know how the study is really designed. So if they're just purely you know, asking women in that age demographic to rate their happiness on you know one to ten, that would be one thing. But how they extrapolate that it's because uh, you know the causal relationship of you know denying a biological urge, I would be suspicious about how that was quantified. Yeah, it's. Um... God, there's so many, uh, with, with regards to studies, like all the stuff I've done around nutrition and, and uh, basically one of my dreams, one of my, well, it's not even a dream, it's something I'm going to achieve, is to fund research with important topics that is completely non-biased by removing the sponsorship component to it. And uh, what a world we'll live in if we can get some, some real data. Because most of the data, particularly in the food industry, is funded by the food industry. It's like, same with pharmaceutical and, and anywhere else there's an opportunity to make money, um, which is, you know, the constant battle that we are grappling with to try and get through this thing we call life. Do you have any advice for, for anyone listening on how to best manage this kind of topic, this kind of scenario? In terms of understanding what's true? Like how to make the best best decisions for themselves. Oh. <laughs> Throwing under question. the bus there. <laughs> no, no, that's a tough one. Well, I, my foundational philosophy is that if we can have stillness, if we create stillness in our life, and I'm not talking about meditating on a mountain every day for an hour, but if we really get still and ask our heart, we truly tune in to the wisdom of the heart, and we just listen to the very first impulse that comes, usually our intuition will guide us, whether it's what to eat, 
or the job or the person or, you know, whatever it is, I truly believe as trite as an answer as that might be, if we can stop the pace of our life long enough to be just be quiet for a second, our, our inner being will guide us. Um, because I, I would agree that, you know, there's this really naivete that the world of academia is somehow neutral and altruistic, um, but the NIH um, determines what studies are conducted at major universities based on who they will fund. And that dramatically impacts, you know, the, the quote unquote research and science that we kind of blindly want to um, accept as, you know, coming from this really, I don't know, yeah, neutral, deified ivory tower place. It's like, no, those people are, you know, they're just trying to put dinner on the table themselves. Um, and they're highly influenced by corporate interests. So I think it's important to pull back sometimes from those influences and really, really listen. Listen to, you know, what makes sense. Cause I think like the study that you just mentioned, that's totally possible. I could see that. I, I can't imagine not having my children, although truth be told, I did not want to have kids. I didn't think I'd be a great mom uh, based on my own upbringing, but man, do they give me purpose and meaning? And now I'm in the phase of my life where they're about to fly the coop and I'm kind of like, all right, who am I going to create myself as now? And <laughs> what what is my purpose and my mission and my calling in the world if it's not to raise these little people anymore? Slightly uh, change in topic, just as you were saying that last comment, you made me think of um, plenty of examples that I've seen of mums that for one reason or another, put all their eggs in one basket metaphorically from their children and haven't put any time aside for their own self-care and pleasures and that kind of thing. And then when the kids leave or, you know, if the children were to, to die or whatever, something horrendous, then they are totally directionless. Have you, have you got any ideas or suggestions for anyone that maybe is looking to look after themselves a bit better and, disassociate from their kids so they can let them roam free <clears throat> yeah that's a that's a topic very common to conversations i have with women because it's so dangerous it's so dangerous to go there and yet so many of us do it has to be a priority to know ourselves we have to determine that it's just important actually it's as beneficial for the children as it is to us and i would say our relationships and our partners and even our communities to extrapolate a little further beyond that, um, to know who we are, to actually be genuinely curious about that person, to make the time. And you know, the reality is the, the demands, the physical demands of child rearing are so overwhelming. I'm not sure that that's really realistic in the early years. Um, it, is, it is a monumental task. So it requires thinking about taking care of oneself in really small ways. So making sure you do maybe shower or wash your face or brush your teeth before you get your kids ready. Most, most moms will just default do that for everybody else. And then maybe at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, they're running a brush through their hair. And, and it's not about what they look like. It's about the priority that their, their own value and worth has. Like, where are they on the list? So it, it needs to be pretty small when kids are little, and then I think it can grow over time. But taking a class every month, exercising every other day, 20 minutes, you know, something that's really doable, you know, that's one positive benefit of the digital age is there's apps and YouTube videos and all these things where people can access meditations, yoga, exercise, weightlifting, you know, whatever it is that's interesting to them. But for, to me, the most healing beneficial way for a mom to, to deeply continue knowing who she is, is to do something creative every day that she says she doesn't have time for. Otherwise, all that creation energy goes into the kids and kind of what you're alluding to happens. Like they leave, they're, they're, there's a loss and, and she's completely disoriented. And I'd also say that this has a really negative impact on marriage and partnership because you don't marry each other as parents, you marry each other as these really interesting, vivacious, fun, single people. And then you kind of watch each other devolve into roommates, which is really, really dangerous for relating. Yeah, no kidding. And, and what's, what's ironic, right, is that all of the women I'm talking about are 
have the most extraordinary backgrounds. Like they are so brilliant in multiple disciplines, music and and uh, the corporate world, or like they've got so many transferable talents that that could be utilized in a service orientated way that would create um, a lot more of that um, purple purposeness or pur- purpose. Yeah, is it what's the word I'm looking for? Like just to to receive like some kind of uh, accolade or encouragement to keep doing. And I, and I wonder how many mums actually get a, um, a compliment from people that aren't in the family saying, hey, uh, just letting you know, you're doing a great job. Like you're doing a great job. Like how many compliments did you get outside of your family with your two boys did you get? I remember the one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I My kids were like one and three. I remember it. Trader Joe's a woman stopped me and said, your kids look really well cared for. And wow. I probably was screaming that morning at them. <laughs> I was just like, oh, <laughs> thank you. I feel like a terrible mother. How did that make you feel? You know, it, there was guilt because it was at a time when I was struggling with having two young children. And I was starting to raise my voice to my little guy, which I never did when, uh, or my oldest, which I never did, you know, before his brother was born, having to really, you know, put me over the edge. And that's, you know, an answer that goes along with your original question, how I got into this, you know, I had my own struggles postpartum and I, I did not understand what was happening and certainly didn't learn about it in graduate school. So I wanted to help other people, but oh my God, that acknowledgement was amazing. And so I've definitely become that mom. And I will say that to people and gosh, I bought some, some mom in the store here where I live. Her kid was just throwing an absolute tantrum. I probably didn't do really the right thing. He needed, he wanted this like Gatorade and her husband had the wallet out in the car. And I was just like, look, I'll just buy it. I was, I got it. <laughs> she was like, thank you so much. I mean, just those little dumb things. I probably wasn't encouraging healthy eating habits there, but it's none of my business. Um, yeah, acknowledging moms for all they're doing. I mean, I would say, although kudos to the stay-at-home moms who do that and find it fulfilling, that's one of the benefits of working, even <clears throat> remotely part-time. I've never met a mom that doesn't say it's a break. And, and that's a lot to work and take care of kids at home. But it's because you get some external validation. You get a paycheck, you get some time off, you get someone saying, good job. It does not happen in parenting. Yeah, and there's, there's a, I mean, we could talk about the subject for, for a day and a half without even scratching the surface, but I'm just thinking as in terms of my role from a, a male point of view, what I or what Anna and I have spoken about, and we don't have children yet. For those who don't know our story, Anna and I have endured uh, some pregnancy problems. We have sixteen consecutive miscarriages. We're getting to the root cause of it by talking to people like uh, Amy Rose. And um, but when we do have them, I want to provide an environment where whatever Anna needs to fulfill her bucket or fill her bucket to fulfill her desires. I can provide that, whether it's the financial resources so she can stay at home and look after the kids, or if she wants to go and do a part-time gig, or she wants to go and do yoga 10 times a week, like whatever it might be. And I just wonder with the breakdown in in the family dynamic in the last, you know, 20, 30 years that we are, we're missing some strong masculine uh, partners that aren't providing enough of a security blanket for the mums to be able to just relax into their divine role as being a mother. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm, That's really interesting. I think a lot of women would agree with you for sure. And on the outside, it can appear as though a man is, I guess, I don't know, is serving the right word from what you just described to me is feeling like you're in service to her. Is that what you're describing? It, it depends. So like, like some men might be just saying, well, I pay all the bills, right? But then there's the missing component where there's the emotional connections completely gone and he's off jerking off to, you know, with a porn addiction and, and off drinking and getting high with his mates. Like, which I, I know real life examples of people that I used to kick around with that would do that, right? Like, um, so there's, there's, I don't know, maybe it's the whole dynamic of what I'm saying. Like, how do we... How do we improve that situation? Well, now you're you're talking about a much larger subject, which is how men understand their role in modern relationships. And that is very tricky because it's evolved so radically over the last 50 years. 
I think a lot of men in their 30s and 40s are extraordinarily confused around their role. If okay, if their partner is so you know capable and she doesn't really need me, I mean that's the primary dilemma for the modern man. I think is that men recognize women actually don't need them anymore. That wasn't true 60 years ago. They don't even need them to have children, technically, in you know some scenarios. So how men feel appreciated, needed, how men actually the word the reason I use service is because that's my understanding. I believe men absolutely need to be respected, appreciated, and have service. If they don't make their partner's life better in some way, they really feel inept, like failures, they feel kind of meaningless. Um, same with work. That's why a man's career is so important. He has to feel like he has a mission and is impacting the world in some way. But that requires a woman to be willing to receive a man to support her then emotionally, because that's basically what we do need men for. We need men to support us emotionally, to know us intimately, uh, psychologically, spiritually. Um, we need to be seen and heard and cherished and adored. You know, those are deep, deep fundamental emotional, psychological, spiritual needs that women have. But most men don't realize that that's actually the more essential role and that going to work and paying the bills is a is, is big part of that. It's part of saying, I'm protecting you so that you can surrender, so that you can soften to life. Um, and I, one of my favorite teachers, David Data, he says that the modern woman is a better man than most men. And I think that's the dilemma is because what you're creating in your marriage is being truly a good man in all respects. You're not just putting bacon on the table, so to speak. You're, you're, you're supporting her vision and goal. And that might be to also work or not. Um, but it's that surrender. If you're willing to be the solid space so she can soften and like literally open up emotionally in all other ways that most you know people want in relationships, man, that requires such spiritual maturity. It requires a lot of inner work. It, it requires um, discipline, as you know, you know, going from your past, the little that I know, I'm halfway through your book, um, <laughs> to your present, it requires a total evolution from that really immature, me-centric way of being, which is natural for all of us when we're young, to, to true masculinity, which is what you're describing. Well, I've got I've got a solution for the men out there that are going, well, how the how on God's green earth do I do this, right? I'm not saying this will work with every single person, but the foundation of of Anna and I's relationship was built on a very strong structure of trust. There's a book that I read by Mark Manson called Models, which is about attracting women through honesty, which I read, I think, 2017. And and I and it was really, it's as simple as it sounds. It's like we don't need to pretend to be someone else to attract the right person. Because of that, it set a really great precedent in a relationship. So you talk about what is the what is the the role of the man in the relationship? Well, it's not it's not the same for everyone. But if you're able to have really honest conversations about what what boundaries, what values, and all these other things that are really important, then you'll know. Right. You, you, as you spend time, we've been together nearly four years and we're getting to know each other. You know, we thought we knew, knew each other really, really intimately a year into it. But then it's just there's no substitute for another three years. Right. And so I'm really clear on what lights Anna up and her on me. And because we've got this this dynamic, I benefit tremendously from it as well, because her whole love language is empowering me with her feminine energy and allowing me to lead in the relationship. And that might trigger a few feminists out there, but that's her language. So I don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right. I'm right there with you. And I consider myself a feminist and aligned with what you just said. I don't believe they're mutually exclusive. Feminism is simply we're equal as human beings. We matter. We matter equally. Our value is the same. Yeah, that's, the, all, that's all that is. The, the the word feminist, I think, has evolved. It's like it's, <laughs> it's like been, being being safe, like being, being safe ten years ago versus now is <laughs> like it's just not even the same word anymore, right? Um, like, like triggered. So there's so many topics. There's like there's like the uh, the the underground route of like <laughs> where, where where can we take this? <laughs> well, we, can I say, say can I say one more thing just about you talking about Anna? Yeah, please. I, I just want to add that when it, because we're talking, we were talking to come back, you know, to postpartum pregnancy, emotional wellness. 
if a woman doesn't trust, if she doesn't feel safe, as you just described, you've set up your relationship, if she doesn't feel safe to allow you to do that, if she doesn't feel like she will really, she can trust you in that way, then she will do it all to excess and get sick. So it is actually really pivotal if we're talking about perinatal, by the way, that's just conception through the first year postpartum. If we're talking about perinatal wellness, that dynamic is actually, it's massive to understand because I can't tell you how many women I've worked with that they just don't trust their partner. It's not just they don't trust them to be honest, it's they don't trust them to show up. And if a woman doesn't trust her partner to show up, whether that's a man or a woman, she will not listen to her body. She won't listen to her emotions. She won't know what she needs. And that feminine energy like withers and kind of dies away. And then you see all sorts of yucky stuff like loss of passion and sexual chemistry and the worst case scenario, kind of loss of motivation and gusto for life, which both men and women have. That, that is radiance, right? It's like... It's like really being connected to the creative life force of the universe. And, and that's a massive cost to pay. Oh, amen, sister. And I was, gonna, I was gonna be quite crass and say, well, men, in the lead up to her getting unwell, she's gonna stop banging you too. And, uh, and, and as that, that um, resentment, cause it's the rejection thing in the man, it's like, there's a whole litany of other disasters that will eventuate. She won't be getting the emotional, physical and spiritual uh, component of the intimacy that's required, you know, in, in relationships. And it's just a shitstorm. <laughs> it's just a downhill shitstorm, isn't it? Well said. <laughs> yes. <it's... laughs> maybe, I, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should, no, no, I shouldn't uh, start treating patients. Like <laughs> I'll stick to coaching. <laughs> it's funny, you know, like, like uh, most of the, I'd say actually all of the, the coaching clients that I have um, without revealing any details about them, it's all to do with improving. A lot of it's to do with uh, the dynamic and the relationship. And, uh, uh, you know, I am able to speak from a position of authority because I'm, I am living it and I am being it. You use that word before. It's, it's like, what kind of person do I need to be to have this kind of outcome? And it's a great question to ask. It might be the only question to ask. And so from a female perspective, what's the, what's the, the wording you would use for the, for the feminine in the relationship to ask? What would it take for you to allow? What, what would, would it, it take? What would it take for you to allow? Okay. Write that one down, folks. That's, <laughs> an, that's a gold nugget. 4,000 from. <laughs> what would it take for you to trust? Because the, when you get it right, it's, it's a very quick shift uh, in my personal experience. I can't test to testify to everyone, but um, energy in a relationship shifts very quickly when you're doing the right things and when you're doing the wrong things as well. Do not get me wrong. Yeah, it's about the dance, recognizing. Right? Yeah. Where can people find you? At amyrosewhite.com. It's my website. Amy, Amy Rose White, spelt the way it sounds, dot com. Yep. Not, not with spelt the way it sounds in there, amyrosewhite.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long domain name. Um, do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience today? Uh, I think my concluding thought is to really remember that at the end of it all, you are source energy. You are the solution to all of your problems. But that means being willing to reach out to be held and receive when your structures don't feel able to do that and in doing so you can actually teach people how to do that you can teach people how to be there but you have to be willing to take that first step ladies and gentlemen amy rose white <laughs>